This time, we'd like to really especially thank our partners at Progressive Policy Institute and ITIF for joining us in sponsoring this event. You know, one of our engineers maybe later can remind me why we call broadband broadband. I don't remember technically why we call it broadband as opposed to wideband or whatever. Uh, but we really want to emphasize the idea of broad this morning in the policy area. You know, there's, there's broad understanding today of the importance of broadband in our society. There's broad appreciation for the transformational effect of broadband as it reaches communities and as it reaches home. As, as children receive their educational curriculum streamed over the internet. As, as we redefine the, the term dock in a box to mean not the emergency care facility down the street, but literally a doctor that you can consult with over a screen in your living room. There's broad understanding of these benefits. There's broad understanding that broadband has to make economic sense and that new content and that new business models have to make economic sense for them to be rolled out and deployed to people. And there's broad understanding of the fact that regulations impose costs on the companies and the network companies who try to do these things. Now, there's lots of disagreement about the details of how do we get broadband out to people. There's lots of debate about the details of which regulations make sense and which, which regulations do not. But there's broad appreciation of the fact that regulation imposes costs, and so we need to give careful thought to what sort of regulations we allow to be imposed on business models and new networks and such. There's broad understanding that you have to attract capital to make these things happen, to roll out networks and to build new businesses. So we would argue that there's, there's more broad consensus on these really critical issues related to communications policy and to, and to internet policy than there is disagreement. And over the last few years, there's been such an emphasis on the disagreements and on the fights. And we, we fear that sometimes we may lose some appreciation for the broad consensus that exists. And that's one of our goals this morning is to sort of revisit that and to remind ourselves of the broad appreciation from across the ideological spectrum that, that most of us have on those issues. And indeed, if we're going to move forward, if we're going to continue the successful rollout of broadband, if we're going to continue to deploy broadband to unserved areas, if we're going to continue to build new and interesting business models, we have to start paying attention to the broad consensus instead of getting so derailed and sidetracked by some of these minor disagreements over details. And so we've tried to put together a program today that's very broad. It's broad in topic. Uh, the folks who are on panels and the folks who are speaking come from a, a broad array across the ideological spectrum. Uh, they belong to different political parties. They, they belong to organizations that often disagree on things. But we've all come together to largely agree on the importance of the communications industry, on the importance of getting communications policy right so we don't fall behind, and more importantly, so our people don't fall behind in the opportunities that communications technology and the broadband makes available to them. So like I said, we're trying to pack an awful lot in this morning, so I want to move quickly to introduce our first keynote speaker, who we're just delighted to have with us, the Honorable Rich, Rick, Rick Boucher. Uh, Mr. Boucher, of course, as you all know, is a former chairman of the House Commerce Communications Subcommittee, and most importantly, I think, has been involved in every important technology and communications policy debate and discussion in over, in over the last 20 years. I'm not going to read you his entire bio. You'll find in your program we have complete bios of all of our speakers. So if you want to look up the details of someone's bio, it's better to look back there than for someone to come up here and read it to you. I just want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, Mr. Boucher, as we were just discussing at the table, uh, moved one of the very first pieces of legislation related to the Internet, which opened up what was then called NSFNet, to commercial content. I mean, think, think in retrospect how important that was to open that door and to set that precedent. Do any of you remember NSFNet? I know Richard does. I don't know how many of the rest of you do. Uh, he co-authored the forerunner of the very important Telecom Act of 1996, under which we still live and move and breathe and have our being. And as I mentioned earlier, or no, I didn't mention this, he also was co-founder of the Congressional Internet Caucus, one of the most successful and most important of the congressional caucuses that we have on the Hill today. So without further ado, let me tell you how pleased I am to introduce to you the Honorable Rick Boucher. Mr. Boucher?
Well, Tom, thanks so much. I appreciate the invitation today of the Institute for Policy Innovation to offer some thoughts to you on some of the key legislative issues that are pending before the Congress that actually have the opportunity to result in legislation being passed by both houses and signed into law by the President. Uh, I'm not planning to spend time today on the network neutrality debate. Tom and I were just talking about that debate, and, and we think enough's been said about it already. Um, it has um, really reduced itself at this point to an argument over philosophy, and it really offers no opportunity for legislation that could be signed into law. The FCC has promulgated a network openness order. Verizon has now petitioned the Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia to overturn that order, and that's really where the action on that subject is. It's in the courts, and while you will probably see legislation pass the House that would deny funding to the FCC uh, to enforce that order, or perhaps try legislatively to overturn that order, um, it, the legislation, if it passes the House, goes no further. It's hard to imagine any circumstance under which the Senate would adopt any of those measures, and if the Senate did, the President certainly would veto those measures, and so it's really a debate about philosophy. And what I'd like to discuss with you this morning uh, is the potential for several matters to actually emerge as legislation that could pass both houses and be signed into law by the President. And I'll refer to three of those matters during the course of my remarks to you this morning. First, we can expect an early focus on efforts to extend privacy rights to Internet users. There's a growing concern about the privacy of people who use the Internet and about the information that they share with the websites that they visit. It seems like every year we are seeing uh, reports of large data breaches where information that is stored by individual companies is inappropriately released, uh, and uh, that, of course, results in a lot of reporting about the kind of information that is released and the large volume of information that is contained in those breaches. That causes public concern. There are also news stories with increasing frequency about the practices of commercial websites to collect information about website visitors and then track the progress of those Internet visitors across multiple websites, across an advertising network, for example. And the combination of all of this press reporting, I, I think, is leading to a heightened sense of concern on the part of Internet users that their experience on the web is less than fully secure. And that, in turn, retards the willingness of Internet users to trust the Internet for, the wi for a wide array of commercial transactions. And so the underlying goal of passing privacy protections for Internet users is to give a greater sense of confidence that the experience on the web is secure. And with that greater sense of confidence, I think, comes a greater willingness on the part of the Internet-using public to trust the web, to engage in more commercial transactions on the Internet, and so the net effect is not to retard commerce, as some in, involved in Internet advertising suggest a, a set of privacy guarantees might do, but it's exactly the opposite, and that is to encourage greater levels of Internet commerce uh, and electronic commerce um, than we have at the present time. A number of bills have already been introduced, primarily in the House, and if you're following the issue, you've probably seen reporting on these. They would offer, uh, among other things, a do not track uh, option that Internet users could, uh, could elect in order to prevent the websites they visit from tracking their progress across the web. Or they would give the Federal Trade Commission authority to enforce privacy rights through a safe harbor arrangement. And I think more legislation can be expected uh, before the serious debate on these matters begins. I'll just mention what I think the key ingredients of 
any legislation that emerges and potentially could be signed into law would contain in terms of extending privacy rights. First, there would be a requirement that any website which collects information from the internet using public provide full notice of what information is collected and how that information is used. And in the category of how it's used would be uh, the circumstances under which that information might be shared with third parties and an identification of the third parties who might have access to the information that website collects. The second key ingredient would be an ability on the part of the internet user to act on the information contained in that notice. And that action would be either to offer consent for the information to be collected and used as announced in the privacy policy or to withhold that consent. And the withholding of consent will be in one of two categories, either what we call opt-out or opt-in. And I'll take just a moment to talk about the difference between those two terms because the crux of the debate on the extension of privacy rights to Internet users will revolve around the circumstances under which opt-out becomes the operating requirement as compared to when that requirement is opt-in. Opt-out is the easiest thing to occur. It is the practice that Internet advertisers would prefer if privacy legislation is to pass at all uh, because it is the default position. It's what happens when the Internet user observes a privacy policy or doesn't observe it and just passes by it and goes ahead and uses the services of the website. That is uh, what we commonly refer to as opt-out. It essentially means that the Internet user does nothing. And if the Internet user does nothing, then the website would be permitted to collect and use the information in accordance with the terms that are described in that website's announced privacy policy. Uh, the opposite of that, opt-in, is where some affirmative action is required on the part of the Internet user before the website can collect or use the information. And that means in practical terms that the Internet user would have to take that affirmative step by clicking a box, for example. Um, and, and that is uh, very unlikely to occur in the vast majority of circumstances. Most Internet users simply would do nothing and, um, and allow the, the collection of information if opt-out is the regime. If it is opt-in, as you can readily see, very few people would probably elect to click that box, and the result would be that far uh, fewer incidences of information collection and use would be permitted. So the Internet advertisers very definitely do not like the opt-in approach. Uh, privacy advocates oftentimes would strongly advocate the opt-in approach. Last year, I put together, along with Cliff Stearns, the ranking Republican member of the Subcommittee on Communications Technology and the Internet, which I had the privilege of chairing, a discussion draft of Internet privacy rights legislation. And we used opt-out as the basic operating principle. So for the vast majority of things, we would simply uh, say that the notice had to be published, and then um, if an Internet user wanted to take a step to prohibit the website collecting and using the information in accordance with that policy, uh, the affirmative opt-in would have to be used. Otherwise, uh, in the absence of the Internet user doing anything, opting out, uh, we would um, allow the website to collect and use the information. There were, however, some exceptions. And these are exceptions that I think you would generally see in any legislation that uses opt-out as the basic operating principle. One of those exceptions is about so-called sensitive information. And that sensitive information would be things like government identifier information, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, passport numbers, anything that uh, contains specific personally identifiable information linked to a government-issued document. Geographic location information. Most cell phones today uh, 